Thank you all for being here tonight, and I'd like to acknowledge the elected officials that are here. U.S. Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky, Illinois State Senator Laura Fine, Illinois State Representative Jennifer Gongerschwitz, Judge Thomas Cushing of the Circuit Court of Cook County, Judge Michael Strom of the Circuit Court of Cook County, and the District 202 School Board Member Gretchen Livingston and District 65 School Board Member Rebecca Mendoza. I would also like to thank all the students and community members who are part of organizing this event. I am here tonight to learn how to best reject hate, and I'm inspired by those of you who have chosen to come this evening. Hate speech is present in our schools, our communities, on our televisions, and on our social media. A healthy society cannot tolerate hate. People around this co country recognize and experience the effects of hate every day. Tonight, we will hear from the individuals who are actively working to push back against hate. This is an opportunity to gain a deeper understanding of hate and learn how to take action. If you have questions, there will be a Q&A at the end with all of the speakers. When you have a question, write it on the card um, that you received on your way in and raise your hand and the people will uh, collect them throughout the program whenever you have the question. Um, we open this evening's conversation about hate speech with Leisha Brooks of the Southern Poverty Law Center. The Southern Poverty Law Center is an important American non-for-profit legal advocacy organization. Their work includes monitoring hate groups and other extremists throughout the United States and exposing their activities to the public, the media, and law enforcement. Leisha is the Chief Workplace Transformation Officer where she serves both the Southern Poverty Law Center's leadership and staff to build a workplace culture of inclusiveness and ensure a sustainable infrastructure that supports the Southern Poverty Law Center's ongoing focus on diversity and equity. Brooks previously served as the SPLC's outreach director where she traveled across the US and abroad to counter hate and extremism and promote the celebration of difference. She also served as the director of SPLC's Civil Rights Memorial Center, an interpretive center designed to provide visitors to the Civil Rights Memorial with a deeper understanding of the civil rights movement. She joined the SPLC in 2004, revitalizing the Teaching Tolerance Mix It Up at Lunch Day program, which strives to break down racial, cultural, and social barriers in schools. We are honored to have you here tonight. Please help me welcome Leisha Brooks. Thank you, Echo. Yes, I am Leisha Brooks. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm just so happy and honored to be here. And so anytime students are organizing some event, I'm just, I'm honored to be a part of it. So let me add my congratulations to all the students who put this together, I think you should give them a round of applause. And I'm from Montgomery, Alabama, and I just cannot even believe all of the elected officials that were introduced. This is fabulous. This is, congratulations, Evanston. I have a little news from Montgomery, Alabama. It made national news. I don't know if you heard. But we elected in Montgomery, Alabama, our first African-American mayor last night. <laughs> former birthplace of the Confederacy, and so it's a big deal. It may have taken a long time, but it happened, so we're really proud about that. As was mentioned, in Montgomery, Alabama, we have the Civil Rights Memorial Center, and I like to start my talks showing the memorial. And by doing so, I, I mean to honor those who came before me. When we think about kind of the, the struggles, the issues, the hate, the extremism that we're facing today, it's not really new. It might feel new, and it might feel awful, but this has happened. Hate and extremism has, have existed in this country for a very, very long time. The Civil Rights Memorial was um, dedicated in 1989, designed by Maya Lin. She's the artist and architect who did the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C. She chose the, the quote that's on the wall um, from a speech that Dr. King delivered at the March on Washington. He also kind of used it as a mantra, until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. And that, I think, is our charge. That's our charge at the center, and that's the charge that I leave with you. Until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream for all of us. So I know that you're here tonight because you know that that's not happening. We're here to, to discuss hate and extremism and hate speech. And even before I begin, let me say that the Southern Poverty Law Center are proud defenders of the First Amendment, but we're proud and fierce 
advocates in, in terms of pushing back against hate and extremism, as Echo mentioned. The memorial, lastly, honors 40 individuals who were killed between um, 1956 and 1968. Again, reminding us that people have been dying for a very, very long time in this country over the issue of hate. The Southern Poverty Law Center got in this kind of business of hate and extremism in the mid-80s. We started, as Echo said, as a civil rights law firm. In the early 80s, we, we brought a suit against the United Clans of America, and it was the first successful civil suit that was ever brought against a hate or extremist group. A young man named Michael Donald was abducted, brutally murdered, and then lynched from a tree in Mobile, Alabama in 1981. We sued the Klan and the Klan leadership, and his mother, a black woman, won a $7 million judgment against the Klan, and that put them out of business. That relationship with the Klan, suing the Klan, um, brought us to their attention, and they started monitoring and watching us. Our offices were firebombed in 1983, and thus the dance began. So we started a program called, originally called Klan Watch that's now called the Intelligence Project, where we track and monitor hate and extremist groups. A big part of that work is publishing this hate map every year. It's an accounting of all the active hate groups that exist in the United States. We're always looking a year back because, you know, we're looking at what happened the previous year. But I like to show this, this, this um, nationwide map because it shows that hate is in, in literally every state in the country. There, are, there were 1,020 active hate groups that we identified in 2018, 1,020. That's about a 30% increase from 2014, about a 7 to 14, 7% increase over 2017. But that's huge. When I thought about 2014 and being at a high school, like y'all were probably in middle school and it's just growing. So it's 1,020. It includes a number of chapters, and I just wanted to pull this out because I want to talk about um, in a little bit what white nationalists and white supremacists are doing in terms of hate and extremism. They're packaging, repackaging it as something different. You, they're not easily recognizable, say, like Klan members were. So you have groups like the, the Proud Boys, they call themselves the Proud Boys. Sounds pretty innocuous. They call themselves a male chauvinist group. They have 44 chapters in the United States. And this is the group that repeatedly goes to the Pacific Northwest. They were in Portland recently and um, go out of their way to go to places where they, they believe there's an extreme left to recruit new members. There's a 50% increase in the number of white nationalist groups in 2018, just in the category of white nationalists. We identify different types of uh, hate groups, different ideologies. Um, the, report, the, the overwhelming majority are white supremacists and anti-Semitic. But we also have what we call um, black nationalist groups, which are, ha are growing, but are a much different, different proposition, and not to, at all to be confused with white extremists or uh, white nationalist terrorism. There have been about 40, oh, I'm sorry, I got the 40 chapters of that, but there have been about 40 people who have lost their lives in North America in 2018 because, as a direct result, of white supremacist domestic terrorism. And the last of the, for this slide, there's 612 anti-government groups. And I want you to think about that. We call them anti-government extremist groups. And they begin to merge. We keep, we keep a separate kind of accounting of hate and extremist groups, and then a separate accounting of what we call anti-government groups, but the lines are becoming very, very blurred. Right? So you can also find this information on our website. If you went to our website, you notice that Illinois has 31 active hate groups identified in 2018. 31. And just a few I pulled out that identify as um, neo-Nazi or white supremacists, you have two chapters of Aryan Nation, and the Aryan Nation has been around since the 80s. There's one in Canton, and there's one in Wood River. You'll know where that is, I don't. Then you have a group called um, Ottomwaffen, which is a very, very, very dangerous, violent neo-Nazi group. An Ottomwaffen, an Ottomwaffen division just started in 2015, 
and now they have chapters all over the United States. They started in 2015, and so I'll repeat it. They have chapters all over the United States. They're also now in the UK, in Canada, and in Germany. You have uh, chapters of Identity Europa. That's a group that particularly targets young people. That's the group that puts out these posters over college campuses, also trying to look, look innocuous. It's okay to be white, or pictures of Michelangelo, or um, posters promoting uh, Western civilization. Make no mistake about it, Identity Europa is a white nationalist group. Identity Europa is the group that coined the expression, you will not replace us. Jews will not replace us. You'll remember that refrain in that neo-Nazi chant that um, went forth across the nation from, Charlotte, from Charlottesville. That's Identity Europa. They put forth the conspiracy theory, the false conspiracy theory, that there's a white genocide afoot. And that group started, God, I don't want to say 2016. They haven't been in existence that long, that long either started by one guy in California, and it spread across the country. It's just that, it's just that serious. Then you have another group called um, White Boys Society. And I wanted to name those in particular, in particular for the young people and parents too. Like if you hear those names, Identity Europa, White Boys, or you hear things like that, you need to pay attention. They're white nationalist groups, they're not civic groups, they're not, um, uh, anything other than practice, practice serves or supporters of white supremacy. The Southern Poverty Law Center also issues, in addition to the hate map, and we issue a, a report called the Intelligence Report that we provide free of charge to law enforcement agencies and Homeland Security to keep them aware of the threat from domestic terrorism. It used to be, in a former administration, the um, Attorney General's office and Homeland Security paid attention to our reports. It used to be that there was a time when the, the federal government was concerned about the threat, the rising threat of domestic terrorism. But in this current administration, actually as soon as, as soon after his inauguration, he stopped all funding for domestic terrorism and, and said he was gonna concentrate solely on the threat from foreign jihadists. A real threat, the domestic terrorists have killed more people in the United States post 9-11 than any um, Islamic jihadists. Case in point, and this is a pretty awful image, but it's an image nonetheless that I think really paints a, a, a pretty, pretty accurate picture. This is the stockpile of weapons from a self-proclaimed white nationalist who was a, recently arrested and accused of planning a mass killing. His name was Christopher Hansen. He was a Coast Guard lieutenant when he was arrested. These are the weapons that he stockpiled. He said that he was targeting politicians and journalists, and he planned on his mass killing being bigger than anyone else's. The threat is real, and it may not, will not probably, will not come from um, a stereotype of Im or image of the person that you think is gonna be behind this. It's very real. In addition to people like you know, the, the Coast Guard Lieutenant, you have, as I mentioned earlier, these 612 anti-government -extreme, anti extremist groups. You have people out, in, you know, in their own little vigilante parties, plotting. And though they, they don't identify as white nationalists or white supremacists, and we don't tag them as such, they play a pretty good uh, second. This is, um, this is the acting director of Homeland Security. And I don't know if you caught this, but this was pretty big news it was in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago. The acting, the acting director of Homeland Security broke from the Trump administration and actually spoke out and said in no uncertain terms that the threat from white supremacists is the biggest domestic threat in America today. He said that the continuation of racially based violent extremism, particularly violent white supremacy, is an abhor abhorrent affront to the nation. That's true. 
it's more than abhorrent, it's killing people. Remember I mentioned that over 40 individuals have been killed just this year. <clears throat> Sorry. Oops. So let's go back to this image of the Klan. Because sometimes I think that, that this is how we recognize, this, is, this, is, this, is, this helps us recognize hate and extremism and it makes it okay for us to say, oh, that's bad. And we can also point out, oh, they're the bad guys. There was, there was tremendous public um, outcry when, when neo-Nazis marched through the streets in Charlottesville holding um, tiki torches that were reminiscent of torches at Klan rallies in the 50s and 60s, and rightfully so. Hearing neo-Nazi chants like, you will not replace us, Jews will not replace us, that's a Nazi slogan, and it's upsetting. But we cannot wait to see these images before we act. Right? Because the, the identity Europa, white, these white nationalists, these alt-right groups, it was over, I believe, over 13 different white nationalists and, and so-called alt-right groups that organized for a year before they got to Charlottesville. And you best believe in their, in their neighborhoods, in their homes, on their jobs, they were not you know, sporting swastikas or burning torches. So we have to pay attention. This guy. His name is Matthew Heimbach. And around 2015, he's the one that started the first um, white, uh, what did he call it? He called it a, a white group, white pride group at Townsend University. And he was the first one that started this act trying to activate students on college campuses and um, push, again, push that false narrative that there was a white genocide af afoot that people were trying to get rid of white people and nobody cared about, about white people but him. And he purposely went out of his way and he goes to rural areas, he goes and pray, prays on poor white folks and tells them nobody cares about you but me. He didn't grow up poor, he didn't grow up in, in, in a trailer park, but he moved to Indiana and, and developed that persona and then he had a following. And he's just, he, he's, he's done the college campus circus, he, circuit, he continues to do so, but then he was, he, he, he caught a felony charge for some ridiculousness because he's, he's a ridiculous person, but he's, <laughs> he's dangerous. Matthew Heimbach. And this is Gavin McGinnis, who is um, the head of the, that group, the Proud Boys that I told you about. Now the Proud Boys are, they'll be the first to say, we're not white supremacists, we're not right nationalists. They invite white nationalists and white supremacists to their rallies all the time. White supremacists and white nationalists hang out with them every time they show up. We're not, we're not white supremacists, we're not white nationalists. We have people of color in our organization. People of color have been subjected to racism for so long that we suffer from self-hatred too. That does not make you not a white nationalist or white supremacist group. He calls, he calls the group, the Proud Boys, a, a male chauvinist fraternity. The key there is that is this, this connectedness, this intersection of racism and misogyny that's also popping up. This pushback against um, cultural and demographic shifts extends beyond race to gender, to sexual orientation and sexual identity to religious diversity, to all of it, and trying to move back to a place of, of um, white Christian dominance. We see it, and I have this image here because it reminds me to talk about not only what they do in terms of, of re what white nationalists and white supremacists do in terms of recruiting and rallies and hate and even, even murder, but white nationalism and white supremacy has crept into our national policies. It used to be kind of on the fringes of the policy, of policy debate, but what we are witnessing and what we need to understand and accept is that policies that are now in effect, particularly with respect to anti-immigration anti policies, are white nationalists in, in theory. They, they are white nationalist policies. You've got Stephen, Miller, who's a, a white nationalist, I'll just say it, he is. No one gets that upset <laughs> about 
an, an immigrant population and comes up with these hateful, inhumane laws and not, and, and not have that kind of ideology attached. White supremacy, white nationalism, this hate that we've grown to kind of accept. Of course, the, the ultimate, um, kind of the, the other end of the spectrum is this tremendous death, this killing, that now, be, now, now, that now has become a bit commonplace. In March of this year, 50 Muslims, uh, Muslim worship, worshipers were killed over at two mosques in Christchurch, New Zealand, remember that? And, and the world was upset, and rightfully so. The neo-Nazi that committed this horrific act said, he quoted other neo-Nazis and said, we must secure the existence of our people and a future for white children. Now that's been a neo-Nazi slogan since post-Holocaust. Five weeks later, in April, a 60-year-old woman observing Passover was killed at the Shabbat of Poway in California. Five weeks after the attack against Muslims. And then the attack at Poway was exactly six months after the massacre at the Tree of Life in Pittsburgh. I don't recount these things to like, I don't know, I don't, I don't, I don't mean to be hyperbolic, I'm not, I'm not. But I want us not to forget these things that are happening and to recognize the frequency with which it's happening. 11 Jews were killed or massacred in Pittsburgh. So we have this increase in white nationalism that, has, that, that is also tied into um, an increase or an animation of, of anti-Semitism, another thing that we're not paying attention to. And I know that, that someone's gonna speak about this and I'm so excited about it because Anti-Semitism is the foundation, it's the blueprint for white nationalists. And if we don't pay attention to anti-Semitism, we'll never understand what's happening with white nationalism. It's the same playbook. So we have this, this, this anti-Semitic, you know, this, this re-emergence of, not that it ever went away, but now it's just more prominent, this notion of this conspiracy theory about Jews and that Jews are running this whole thing, they're the ones that are responsible for the increase in immigration, they're the ones that are responsible for um, moving black folks into positions of power, they're the ones that are responsible for all of the cultural change, they're responsible for everything. And that's why you have the, the attacks on Jewish places of worship by white nationalists. And the things that they're doing and the propaganda that they're pushing out is exactly the same. <clears throat> and if we don't pay attention to if we don't pay attention to anti-Semitism, I, I don't I don't I don't I don't know what to I don't know I don't I don't know what to say to get us to pay attention to it. I mean, in the last few years, like the the increase of the swastika has just thrown up everywhere, and people just act like it's another tag. It's a swastika, which is a symbol of anti-Semitism and is a symbol of white supremacy, and we can ill afford. We can ill afford, sorry, get on a rant, and now I've got five minutes. Um, we, we can ill afford to not pay attention to it. <sighs> then, of course, we had El Paso. These things are all tied, right? Remember I said that, anti-immigration. And the, the, the killer in this case said, and they're, they're all very happy to say why, why they did what they did. It's the threat in Texas the, the disappearing of white people, or however he put it, in Texas, that used to be Mexico, ah, I don't know. So let me tell you about the demographic shifts just really quickly. So in 1970, the United States was about 83% white, 17% people of color. And I have to say, that feels comfortable for most white folks or people in positions of power, right? It's like some diversity, not, not a lot. But today, and it's increasing, this, these statistics are probably not as accurate, 66% white, 34% people of color. Now, if you're looking at these numbers and think, oh, that's not a real big increase, it's a huge increase. It's huge. 
that's when like neighborhoods start changing, you see different people, you're like, go back to your old neighborhood, and you're like, what happened to that store? Where are, who are these people? What's going on? And then people get the, the false impression that they're being displaced, even though they already moved. So that is what white nationalists are using and think that it's a conspiracy, when in fact, it's a natural demographic shift that's been occurring over time, which I can show you with this um, graph. So today, people 55 and over, 75% um, white. That's why you can look at a Trump rally and say, God, there's a lot of white people still. 25% <laughs> of people of color. But you take it down 10 years and look at, that, look at that shift. This is today. So these are people age 35 to 54. Now it's 61% to 38%. Take it down again, 18 to 34, it's almost half. Today, these are people ages 18 to 34, today. And then under 18, as I like to say, it's already a wrap, it's over. That's why, we, that's why it was, I think, five years ago when um, children of color, babies of color outnumbered white babies in, in births. And then I think it was just this year that um, students of color outnumbered white students in um, K-12 public schools. All of those are demographic markers that have been, that, that had started out long ago. I will say this, that in 2010, when the Census Bureau first, um, first said that, oh my gosh, the, the whites will no longer hold a numeric majority by 2050. Do you remember that? Well, the white nationalists took that as what? And then, to make matters worse, a few years later they said, oh, sorry, not 2050, maybe 2040. And they completely freaked out. And that's when kind of the, everything started getting ratcheted up. It was also the year when the census allowed people, rightfully so, to identify as biracial or multiracial. So then those numbers began to pull from white and black. And white and black numbers, percentages, are pretty cool in terms of growth or around 15%. Okay, 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 I promise. I, this is the last slide, Echo. So, what can we do? Um, in addition to putting out this information, SPLC puts out information, hopefully, to help communities and students and everyone kind of address these things. And these are all free, you can go to our website, download them, I'm happy to send them to you as well. 10 Ways to Fight Hate is a guide for, you know, to act proactively, although most people wait and are reactive. But you can plan ahead. You can work with, with your community to develop communities of, of, of respect um, and uh, cross-collaboration. There's Speak Up at School that's specifically for students that will, will help students in those awkward moments, and, and they happen to everyone, adults too. Gosh, somebody says, says something, what do, I, what do I say? So it helps you with that. Then responding to hate and bias at school is for, for educators. What can you do? And for school administrators, what can I do? How can I conduct a climate survey to see, um, um, is, my, does, is my school safe? Does everyone feel safe here? And what can I do to make people feel stay safe? And then lastly, the bystander in intervention guide, which is for everyone. Everyone will be, has been, and will be, will continue to be in a situation at some point where you're faced with someone saying something bigoted or biased in your presence. It happens all the time. You may not pay attention to it, but it happens all the time. Sometimes you see these viral videos, right, where there's this person at the store and somebody yelled at them. You're at the store and somebody's yelling at somebody or someone's treating someone rudely. The reason why we don't act is because we, we, don't, we don't feel prepared. So the Bystander Intervention Guide gives you tips to prepare you in advance. So when that happens, and someone says something biased or bigoted or racist in front of you, maybe not to you, but to someone else, a Muslim woman in a hijab or, or an immigrant or, or a Latinx person that's speaking Spanish, you'll be able to say something. So the person that's victimized doesn't have to be the one to stand up. That's, I think, one of the number one ways to push back against hate and bias. We have let, we have let white nationalists and white supremacists take hold of the narrative. We can take it back, but we have to speak up. So, thank you. Thank you again to Leisha. 
Um, now I'm excited to introduce my uh, teammates from the debate team. Our first speaker is Eleanor Ward, who is a senior on the debate team who participates in public forum. Our second speaker will be Hannah Littman, who's also on the debate team in public forum. And our final speaker will be Henry Eberhardt, who's a senior on the Lincoln Douglas debate team. We believe that it's important to include the debate team in speaking tonight because exploring well-developed well argumentation is, in, is a key part of understanding an issue and being able to articulate it to have real discourse in the real world. The debate team is also a space of political discussion and community where we bounce ideas off of each other and gain new perspectives. Because of these reasons, we wanted to showcase our debate team debating different proposals on how to combat hate speech and as a model for a positive political discussion. So now I'd like to welcome Eleanor. Hello, my name is Eleanor Ward and I'm a senior on the Evanston Township Speech and Debate Team. As a senior, I am knee deep into the college search process. One thing that has stuck, um, struck me is that a large number of the colleges that I've looked at have had instances of hate speech on their campuses, and this is concerning. Take Duke University, for example. In 2018, a sign on the door of the University Center for Black Culture was marked with a racial slur. Months later, a memorial created on Duke's campus to the victims of the Tree of Life synagogue shooting was defaced with a swastika. Sadly, this narrative is not unique to Duke. It's happening at college campuses across the country, the very place where student, students should feel safe and supported, not fearful for their lives. If we don't take action, incidents like these that promote and incite hatred will continue to occur on college campuses throughout our country. That's why I believe that all hate speech and hateful organizations should be prohibited at colleges in the US. To understand the scope of this problem, let's look at some statistics. Between 2011 and 2016, there was a 40% increase in hate crimes reported on college campuses, and 2016 alone, there were more than 1,000 hate crimes committed on campuses across the US, primarily motivated by biases of race, ethnicity, religion, or sexual orientation. The effects of these incidents cannot be minimized or overlooked. Students victimized by hate crimes on college campuses are more likely to experience mental health issues such as PTSD and depression. Moreover, studies show that students of color are far less likely than white students to describe their campuses as inclusive, and black students in particular are more than twice as likely as white students to say that the racial climate on their campus is poor. For colleges to do their part to help, students, um, to help their students' well-being, there are a variety of actions they can take. One such action is to implement a zero-tolerance policy for hate speech. In an effort to decrease the number of hate crimes at their universities, college administrators need to issue clear-cut punishments for those who engage in hate speech. Colleges need to stand in solidarity with students who are victimized by hate speech. Another action universities can take is to prohibit organizations that vilify others on their campuses and to make a decision to not invite speakers that promote, it, promote hatred in the classrooms. Universities should provide education and training materials that promote awareness about hate crimes and foster a campus climate that discourages such crimes. Moreover, students should have mandatory education programs that promote an understanding of diversity on campus. College administrators have an obligation to their students to protect the most vulnerable members of their student bodies from hateful speech and hateful actions. I know that I'm not alone when I say that it's imperative to me that I attend a university next year that promotes diversity and denounces hate crimes on its campus. Thank you. Um, so now we're gonna do a quick like cross-ex about the speech with Hannah. Thank you. Um, so my first question is, does banning certain speakers from campuses shelter kids from the real world or from differing opinions? Yeah, so to this I would say that um, the ideas, like students understand that the ideas, hateful ideas persist no matter what, and they're not unaware of these ideas, but it's never um, productive to have people that like bring hate to college campuses come, because it doesn't help for like, it doesn't create a deeper learning experience. Um, instead it just, promotes hatred and threatens students' lives, and colleges are the, very, are the very place where students should feel supported and safe, and this is not the case when you have hateful speech or hateful organizations on college campuses, so yeah. Okay, and then my second question is, why is it crucial to focus on like hate speech specifically on college campuses versus other places? Mm -hmm. So obviously we should be focusing on like solving hate speech across you know, the US as a whole, but I think it's really important to start on college campuses specifically because um, for one thing, college campuses like serve as kind of a, a role model for the rest of the world. Like this is a hub of learning, this is where progress is made, um, and that's why it's a key to start at colleges. And then second of all, colleges, like the students on colleges represent the future workforce and they're the youngest citizens in the US. And we want to be training like these students who go out into the world to have like the right ideas about how to approach issues and 
Um, obviously, like, we don't want hate speech to be something that they, that's common to them, but that's something that they think is okay. Um, and so starting off at an early age, that's showing like, hate speech is never acceptable. Um, it's just really important to do at colleges to set the right trends for the future. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Eleanor and Hannah. Um, now I'd like to introduce Kelly Zaney from the Illinois Holocaust Museum. Kelly is the vice president of the Education and Exhibitions. She has been a part of multiple major recent initiatives, including the award-winning interactive holographic survivor stories experience and content development for the Stories of Survival Object Image Memory Exhibition. During her 17-year tenure, she has become recognized as a leading human rights and museum educator, training facilitator, and public speaker. She currently sits on the board of directors for both the Association of Holocaust Organizations and the Educators Institute for Human Rights. She has won multiple awards for her educational and human rights work, including the Carl Wilkins Fellowship, a year-long program where she worked alongside national leaders to create and strengthen a permanent anti-genocide constituency through both advocacy work and influence of US policy. She's the author of Teaching the 1994 Rwandan Genocide Through Stanton's Eight Stages and The Power of Story, Teaching About Genocide Through Literature, Literature Circles. We are fortunate to have her here tonight. Please help me welcome Kelly Zaney. Can you hear me okay? So I need to use my teacher voice. <laughs> um, it's an honor and pleasure uh, to be here with all of you. I want to thank uh, Al Holfield uh, Jr. and the students from uh, the Democratic Party of Evanston and the Debate Club. I think that any time that we have the opportunity, um, in particular also to be able to share the floor with the speakers this evening is great food for my spirit. Um, to know that we're not alone in the fight towards equity and justice and uh, that there are folks out there uh, doing the good work that needs to be done. So I wanna start uh, this evening with um, sharing with you a couple stories um, to kind of give you a bit of a, a scope um, as we look at this evening or what I've been tasked with uh, to talk about um, how we can use the lens of history, particularly the Holocaust and contemporary genocide, to make connections to today, um, and especially uh, the increasing tide of hate speech and, and dangerous speech uh, that we're seeing uh, perpetrated in society. On January 15, 1916, to the government of Aleppo, we are informed that certain orphanages which have opened also admitted the children of the Armenians. Should this be done through ignorance of our real purpose or because of contempt of it, the government will view the feeding of such children or any effort to prolong their lives as an act completely opposite of its purpose, since it regards the survival of these children as detrimental to society. Signed, the Minister of Interior, Talet Pasha of the Ottoman Empire. He, the biology teacher, pulled me up by my sideburns and he put me in front of the class and he said, see here, this is what a Jew looks like. And he started to describe my nose and my cheekbones and my hairs and my feature and how to recognize a Jew. It was so utterly humiliating. September 13th, 1933, Frankfurt, Germany. They told us we were a void. We were less than a grain of rice in a large pile. I was often told by the Khmer Rouge soldiers, to keep you is no benefit, to destroy you is no loss. Tem Kem, Cambodia, 1975. These Tutsi rebels, they are cockroaches and snakes. They are murderers. Rwanda, or our Hutu land, we are the majority. They are the minorities, traitors and invaders. We will squash this infestation. Stay alert and watch your neighbors. Radio Rwanda, 1994. You blacks are not human. We can do anything we want to you. 2003, President of Sudan, Omar al-Bashir. These non-humans, these dogs, these Bengalis, are killing and destroying our land, our water, and our ethnic people. We need to destroy their race. A 2018 Facebook post by an influential government official in Myanmar against the Rohingya population. 
One of the things that when I'm often talking about the Holocaust or contemporary genocide, again, whether it be Armenia or Cambodia or Bosnia or Rwanda, is that it's so important for us to begin to understand that in order to get to that place of violence, we have to understand how we even got there in the first place. And it's important to remember that crimes against humanity and atrocities and genocide, it doesn't happen in a vacuum. It doesn't happen overnight. And along the way, when thinking about genocide or talking about the violence that is perpetrated against a group of people because of their race or religion or gender or sexuality, um, there are early warning signs. There are stages along the way that we as citizens should be and can become aware of. When we look at historical genocide, we as a country, as a citizenry, tend not to intervene or to prevent well after the killing has begun. We tend not to rally our support and to have organizations come together to create aid well after the killing has already been gone. And so this evening I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the lessons that we can learn um, through the hate speech that we have seen over the past uh, 20th and 21st century that has ultimately led to one of the worst crimes, genocide. Um, but how we as citizens, as we think about what's going on in the world today, and you think about perhaps some of the things that I'm telling you about, particularly in regards to dangerous speech and uh, dehumanizing speech, um, how can we begin to think about how can we raise our voices sooner, well before the violence begins, um, and be uh, those actors and those engaged citizens um, that, that become involved. So I want to share with you a couple of lessons uh, that I think are important for us to, to learn along the way. And the first lesson is uh, the one I'm going to spend pretty much uh, most of my time on today. Um, as I said, the first um, and enduring lesson of genocide is that it doesn't occur only because of a machinery of death, but because of the incitement to hate. As um, is often said, the Holocaust didn't start with gas chambers. It started with words. It started with excluding people by creating laws to strip the civil and human rights, not only from Jews, but from millions of others. It is in this teaching of contempt, this demonizing of the other, this is where it all begins, where we create this us versus them mentality. No one is ever born hating or fearing other people. That has to be taught. And leaders have used particular kinds of rhetoric throughout the centuries to turn groups of people violently against one another throughout history by demonizing and denigrating others. The vocabulary does vary, but the same theme reoccurs. Members of other groups are depicted as threats so serious that violence against them seems to be acceptable or even necessary. Such hatred is also meant to promote fear. As much as it is to express or promote hatred. For example, one can assert that another group is planning an attack on one's own group without expressing hatred, yet that that message might easily convince people to condone or commit violence to fend off what could be considered an attack against their group. Violence would seem defensive and therefore justified. For example, contemporary rhetoric in many countries portrays immigrants as a catastrophic threat. Hungary's Prime Minister Viktor Orban and our own administration have referred to immigrants and refugees as a Trojan horse, which will necessarily increase, according to them, criminal activity and terrorism. By describing other groups of people as something other than human or less than human, Speakers can persuade their audiences to deny other people the same moral considerations they give to those who, according to them, are more fully human. Dehumanizing targets prepares audiences to, to condone or commit violence by making their targets' death and suffering seem less significant, or even making it seem useful and necessary. There are several types of dehumanizing messages, each of which elicit certain emotional or practical responses. Speakers often describe the other, 
um, or the outgroup, as biologically subhuman, as animals and in insects or even microorganisms such as bacteria and viruses. Persistently in the case of genocide and mass atrocity, supporters and perpetrators have referred to their victims as vermin, rats, cockroaches, foxes or snakes, beasts or biological hazards such as viruses or tumors or infections. Generally speaking, speakers choose to compare outgroup members with creatures that their audiences regard as repulsive or threatening or deserving of violence. It is almost instinctual knowledge, for example, how to deal with an infestation of vermin. You exterminate it. You try to eliminate it completely. When the Rwanda Hutu extremist media referred to the Tutsi ethnic group as a cockroach, in the months preceding the 1994 genocide, which left hundreds of thousands of Tutsi dead, they suggested the same action. Extermination, one military operation, was called Operation Insecticide. In the same way, government rhetoric during the Cambodian genocide warned the enemies of the Khmer Rouge regime were microbes and a sickness to be completely eliminated, lest they, quote, rot us from within. One regime slogan declared, what is infected must be cut. What is rotten must be removed. Like depictions of humans as infestations of insects, these messages were meant to discuss. But they also suggest that like cancerous growth or bacterial infections, the Khmer Rouge opponents had to be removed completely. Speakers also refu re uh, refer to outgroups as supernatural terms unlike forms of dehumanization which makes targets seem lesser or weaker, supernatural dehumanization makes them seem stronger than humans and threatening to them. In the decades following the United States Civil War and the emancipation of enslaved peoples in the country, newspapers covering lynchings of black people by white supremacists by describing the victims as unnatural monsters who terrorized communities. Combatants in intergroup conflict often try to frame violence as a necessary means to protect against greater harm. Speech often includes a specific kind of collective justification of the violence. The term comes from um, an idea called the accusation uh, in a mirror. It was found in a propaganda recruitment manual um, by the Hutu government in 1994 where the document actually advised attributing to one's enemy the very acts of violence the speaker hoped to commit against them. In this way, the party which is using terror will accuse the enemy of using terror. To predict violence from another group is especially powerful, whether the threat is real or false or fake news or exaggerated, since it makes violence against the group seem defensive and necessary. In this sense, Accusation is a collective against homicide because you can rationalize self-defense. To believe that you, your family, your group, your culture, your people, your religion face an existential threat from another group to others makes violence to fend off that threat seem not only acceptable, but necessary. Some of the most powerful messages come from influential speakers who suggest that their own group is in danger of being totally annihilated. For example, Nazi SS Reichsfuhrer Heinrich Himmler told senior officers in 1943 that we, quote, we have the moral white right to wipe out the Jewish people because they are bent on wiping us out. And in, Je in Bosnia, General Rocco Baladic, who became known as the Butcher of Bosnia, who directed the killings and massacres of more than 8,000 Bosnian men and boys in 1995 in Srebrenica, had earlier claimed that Muslims and Germans and Croatians were planning for the complete annihilation of the Serbian people. By portraying members of the target group as a threat to the audience, this type of message reinforces fear. Moreover, these messages indirectly and sometimes directly wink at violence, instruct people to rid the group of their supposed contaminant to preserve the health of their own group. Notably, this hallmark need not include any prediction of physical violence. 
a culture, group identity, or political project may be threatened instead. While such messages may not invoke fear or bodily harm, they appeal to the powerful emotional connections that connect people with their identity. The Norwegian mass murderer who killed 77 people in July 2011 was motivated by what he called a European cultural suicide brought upon by the influence of multiculturalism, Islam, and cultural Marxism. In his manifesto, he wrote about the fate of European civilization depended on white men like him resisting these influences. Additionally, dehumanizing speech may never mention the other group, but instead characterize members of the inner group as disloyal or too sympathetic to the other group. The second lesson that we can take from historical genocide is the danger of indifference and the consequences of inaction. The genocide of the Rwandan Tutsis occurred because of the crime of indifference and a conspiracy of silence. The world knew what was happening. What makes this genocide so unspeakable is that it was preventable, as most genocides these days are. Even the most inflammatory messages, unlikely to inspire violence if its audience isn't susceptible to it, if its audience chooses to remain indifferent, to remain comfortable in the convenience of their silence. The third lesson is the danger of cultural impunity. If the last century was the age of atrocity, it was also the age of impunity. Few of the perpetrators were brought to justice or accountability for their policies, their words, their actions, just as there cannot be a sanctuary for hate or a refuge for bigotry, neither can there be a haven for perpetrators and the supporters of their speech. The fourth lesson is the danger and the vulnerability of the powerless, and the powerlessness of the vulnerable. Children and women victimized by sexual violence or misogynistic language and actions are generally the first targets of persecution and often those that leave to mass violence. It is our responsibility to empower the powerlessness while giving voice to the voiceless, wherever they may be. The fifth lesson is the cruelty of denial or even revisionism, an assault on memory and truth, a criminal conspiracy to whitewash the facts and to history. It in the most obscene, obscene form of denial is the case that actually accuses the victim of falsifying the violence. It's called a hoax or is part of some sort of dark conspiracy. Today, we have our faith that leaders and policymakers will generate its own factual background. We, of course, naturally have different emotions and values, but we have to ultimately have facts. And without facts, our emotion appeals to the identity of tribalism. Additionally, denial or revisionism often creates a vacuum of responsibility. They must be doing something wrong. See, look, they affirm our stereotypes. And then you are made to feel you are doing right at the precise moment that you are doing wrong. The sixth lesson is the importance of remembering the heroic upstanders, those who remind us of the range of human possibility, those who stood up to confront hatred and injustice, prevailed and transformed history. And finally, and most important, we must remember and pay tribute to the survivors who endured the worst of humanity, of crimes against humanity, and somehow found in the resources of their own humanity the will to go on, to contribute, and to make our society a better and more compassionate community. So what I encourage you today, and especially the young people that are here, is that when you're watching the news and you begin to see the flash of hate speech and dehumanizing language and people being separated by another, that your antenna should raise, that you should use your voice, make more noise about what's happening, that you become not only um, what I call generally an anti-genocide constituent, 
but also an educated anti-genocide constituent. As someone who, in early 2003, became very involved in the Save Darfur movement, I watched the largest gathering of young people speak out since the Vietnam War about what was happening. But slowly I began to see the kids who wrote Save Darfur on their sneakers and wore green bracelets, that they weren't educated about the situation, that they thought Darfur was its own country, that Africa was a country, not a continent. They didn't know the major players and what was happening. And as we know, it's often said that, you know, it, it takes a long time to create change. And in order to create change, when it comes to genocide, when it comes to mass atrocity, when it comes to the violence that we're seeing, what I saw was a group of young people that after a couple of years faded away. Because it becomes difficult to stay engaged. It becomes difficult to stay educated and up on the issues. But to me, that is what's going to help us prevent the ongoing bigotry and racism and mass atrocity and crimes against humanity and genocide that we see today, is that if we collectively become engaged citizens who are aware of the early warning signs, the stages where we need to intervene and speak up well before the violence begins. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. My name is Hannah, and I'm also from the debate team. Last March, John Burroughs star high school football player Jake Bain came out as gay in a speech he gave to the school. Shortly after, the Kansas-based Westboro Baptist Church, one of the most hateful groups in America that is violently opposed to LGBTQ rights, announced that they would picket John Burroughs School in Lado, Missouri. The church referred to Bain as a beast on their website and planned to suffocate him with hateful words at his own high school. Upon hearing about the protest against Bain, students of John Burroughs rallied together and planned a counter-protest. According to Curtis Wong of the, Hopping, of the Huffington Post, John Burroughs' counter-protest consisted of an on-campus 40-minute display of support for the LGBT community at the same time Westboro members made their appearance, followed by a unity walk and a celebratory music-filled assembly. Whitney Lloyd of ABC News notes that as many as 400 people turned up outside of Bain School holding signs with messages of support, some dressed in rainbow colors to represent the pride flag, to counter protest a small group of Westboro supporters who picketed the school. And once the protest was over, Bain declared, the supporters of me and my high school completely drowned out the Westboro Baptist Church protesters. The student response to Westboro's hatred exemplifies what the world needs in vulnerable times like these. The students did not go about censoring the hateful speech, they focused on supporting and caring for the person who is the target of the hate speech. The majority of the outcry after incidents of hate speech is usually about whether or not to let that speech happen. But what's more important is who is affected by that speech and what are we doing about it? Living in America is about survival from marginalized groups of people. Today, there is the added pressure created by the hateful words that seep out of our own political leaders. It is now a matter of not only navigating everyday life in schools and institutions that often perpetuate hate against marginalized groups, but surviving in a world where our own president calls people criminals and terrorists and questions their right to exist as who they are. Clearly, this is a problem, but I'm not going to stand up here and talk about the restrictions or rules or conversations that need to be held in regards to free speech, because my, in my opinion, that is ineffective. We need to do more to support marginalized communities by giving them resources to cope with stress and danger of living in a world plagued by hate speech. There are many things we can do, but here are a few specific thoughts. I propose an increase in wellness resources and funding to nonprofits that build resilience. At ETHS, we have four social workers and two psychologists for a population of about 3,500, which is actually a good ratio in relation to the resources other schools have. Many CPS schools share a mental health professional. In Chicago and other large cities, what support is given, given to citizens to access therapy? Until these policies are signed off on, we need a shift in conversation to make that happen. Right now, free speech and restrictions on speech are in the forefront of political conversations because of the self-serving deflection to which we should be accustomed at this point, says Jelani Cobb. The act of dodging one conversation by replacing it with another admits that there is an underlying issue at hand Otherwise, there would be nothing to avoid. Unless we focus on real issues and the wellness of marginalized groups, society will continue to function in a comfortable space that inhibits progress and fosters arguments. 
Unfortunately, it's not enough to say that you are against hate speech. We need our policies to align with our priorities. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. That was awesome. Um, now I would like to introduce Dr. Gilo Kwesi Logan, an Evanston community member and founding of Logan Consulting Services. Dr. Logan has more than 20 years of experience as a consultant, coach, and educator in leadership, diversity and inclusion. <laughs> His mission is to help leaders, organizations, teams, and individuals develop cultural competencies to succeed in an increasingly complex and diverse society. Dr. Logan has worked with multinational corporations, student districts, government institutions, law enforcement agencies, and non-for-profit organizations. That includes McDonald's, Northwestern University, Evanston slash Skokie School District 65, and the Evanston Police Department. Logan's work in the Evanston Skokie School District 65 includes creating power profile in place of the N-word from a compilation of resources and tools geared towards assisting teachers and staff working with students in grades pre-K through eighth surrounding the N-word. Dr. Logan holds a doctorate degree in adult and continuing education. He is also a recipient of the world's poetry Golden Poet Award for his poem titled, When You Think. Dr. Logan's research specialization includes, but is not limited to, racial and ethnic identity development and transformative learning and leadership. Dr. Logan is author of Cultivating Cultural Competence for Leaders, Tips, Tools, and Techniques for, man for Managing a Diverse Workforce. Please help me welcome Dr. Logan. First, I want to thank you all for coming out on a Thursday night. You could be doing a lot of other things right now, and you chose to be here. So thank you all for being here. And I want to thank the two previous speakers who laid a powerful foundation for the power of hate speech, and I would say hate in our hearts uh, at a global level and both locally here in our country. And I also want to thank my sister, Pam Citronbaum, for being the connection for me being here today. Class of 84. <laughs> and, and I see some people saying, wait, where, oh, the black woman who spoke is his sister? No, not, not that sister, my other sister. <laughs> so Pam is my sister. Uh -huh. and, and Al Hofeld Jr., class of 84, I want to thank you for this opportunity to be here. And last but not least, to thank the students for what you all are doing. Very, very, very powerful. So thank you all. When you are called a nigger, you look at your father because you think your father can rule the world. Every kid thinks that. And then you discover that your father can't do anything about it. So you begin to despise your father. And you realize, oh, so that's what a nigger is. That's a quote by James Baldwin novelist, play, playwright, and activist. The N-word, our country has never existed without it. It may be the most loaded, controversial, powerful word in the English language. The N-word endures because racism against black people endures. And to expect children to understand the history of the N-word is a ridiculous, irresponsible, and even dangerous notion. The N-word, just one form of hate speech in our country and in Evanston. Hate-filled language spoken by our children here in both District, District 65 and District 202 is prevalent. Last year alone, in District 65, that's the K through 8 district here in Evanston, 
and primarily at our elementary schools, here are some of the things that our children were and are saying. I want to know why black children come to this school. This isn't your school. There are voluminous instances of the N-word throughout the district. You dumb black boys, you chimpanzee, monkey, and this hate speech is not limited to black children. You stupid Chinese boy, you can't even speak English. Can you see out of those slanted eyes? They're so small. Brownie, and to Latinx students, a wall will soon come up and you will have to return home. These are quotes from children in our schools here in Evanston, mostly at elementary school. But it goes beyond race. In March 2016, at Northwestern University's Alice Millar Chapel, it was vandalized with swastikas and homophobic language. In 2016, at the Evanston Public Library, a copy of the Quran and seven books on Islam were defaced with swastikas, homophobic slurs, and other offensive graffiti. Approximately a decade ago, when my two sons were in third and fifth grade at Washington School here in Evanston, my third grader came home and he said, Poppy, why are all the people of the week white? Why aren't any of them black? He was in third grade. My fifth grader at that time came home and told me the story that when he was on the playground tussling with another kid, a friend of his, over a ball, the kid looked at him, snatched the ball away, and said, you nigger, give me the ball. He came home and told us as parents, and to his credit, what we teach them is don't react, but respond. Don't get caught up in a reaction to that. And he didn't, so he came home, we talked it over as a family, my wife and I, we went to the school to speak to the principal, to advocate on behalf of our children and other children as well. And to the principal's credit, she acknowledged that, you know, this is a problem, but the problem goes way deeper than that. We have a problem at the staff level, we have a problem with parents, and we have a problem in our district and it's just reflective of some of the problems in our city. So she did not quite know what to do to address the situation. So we requested that the other family come to the table so we can talk about it. We can learn more about that child who said that word, why they said it, and hopefully it can be a teachable moment. The other family refused to come to the table. It was my wife, myself, and the principal. And mind you, the other child was Latinx. So the principal said, you know, I'm not totally surprised, but I'm at a loss for what to do. Do you have any thoughts? So I pulled some ideas from previous work that I had done, and she really wanted to have dialogue at the school. She felt discussion and dialogue was lacking and she wanted to have some courageous conversations. So what we did is we started the Courageous Conversation series at Washington Elementary School. Now this is not the Courageous Conversations that's based on the West Coast. This was simply a Courageous Conversation at the school. And with this, we engaged parents, leadership, staff, and students in discussions and dialogue, not only about the N-word, but about difference, about race, about diversity, about class, gender, sexual orientation, different learning abilities, different styles of learning, different types of families, and etc. This became the basis for the district's um, 
navigating real life diversity based on the work that was happening at Washington School. Fast forward a decade and my colleague and myself, we developed a curriculum and a resource guide for educators here in District 65. It's a curriculum and resource guide for pre-K through eighth educators. And basically we created it with feedback from leadership, from administrators, from parents, from teachers. We aligned it with the equity statement here in the district. We um, aligned it with the learning standards, the common core standards, and we tied it into social emotional learning. And the focus is on academic rigor. So therefore, any educator who feels, you know, the N-word, that's not my thing, or I'm tired of the diversity stuff, well, we're talking about learning standards. And these are many teachable moments. So we created a guide that provides resources for adult learning on the history of the N-word, the history of racism in America, on white supremacy, the language and power of words, and what can or cannot be done to address it, who should and should not use the word. So there's videos and books and articles and links that educators can tap into to enhance their own learning first. Then there's resources that they can choose to use in the school if and or when a situation happens with a child using the N-word. So we just rolled this out last month and we're providing an orientation at all 18 sites and the curriculum is gonna be released a week from Monday. So we'll see how it all rolls out. But so far, it's been a very interesting project. So we, for the early childhood students, some people ask me, wait a minute, so you're teaching them about the N-word in kindergarten? Or you're teaching a first grader how to say the N-word? Like, <laughs> no, that's not what we're doing. At, at that level, it's really about helping children understand their own feelings and to develop language to articulate their feelings in a constructive and appropriate way and have a happy face and a sad face, an indifferent face, and attach words to the face, to the feelings, to develop language. So they're exploring their feelings. There's a book called The Skin I'm In, A First Look at Racism. It's a developmentally appropriate book that we utilize and we develop a curriculum around that. Words that hurt, so grades three through five, we talk about words that hurt. <clears throat> we utilize a book called Ruth and the Green Book that explores Jim Crow laws and segregation in the South. At eighth grade level, I'm sorry, sixth through eighth grade, we're looking at hurtful words and images. So children can explore the N-word, the history of it, the current use of it, and they can have debates and discussion and dialogue, not on their own personal views, but based on research, based on articles, based on academic rigor, based on learning standards to enhance their own learning. With this guide, as I researched and read the literature, I tried to make sense of it myself in a manner of how can I articulate this to educators? <laughs> it's, it's a big task. So what emerged was a model that I'm in the process of developing and writing an article on. It's, it's the CHILL model, C-H-I-L-L -L, as an acronym, for understanding the N-word. The C is for context, the context in which language is used. H is for the history, the history of racism and white supremacy in our country. I is for identity, in particular racial and ethnic identity development and how that's impacted both by the perpetrator and the target of these words. The first L is for lived experience. Depending on our age, depending on where we were raised, what we've experienced, that's gonna shape and mold how we perceive the N-word, if we feel it's appropriate or not. <clears throat> and the last L is for language. 
the power of language because words have no meaning. We give the words meaning. Our lived experiences give words meaning. Our history gives words meaning. Our identities give words meaning. The N-word is indicative of deeper issues and at the same time it becomes a diversion from examining them. Think about that. It's very indicative of deeper issues, but it becomes an obstacle or challenge for further exploring the N-word. So therefore, what I say is, it's indicative of deeper issues, but it also provides an opportunity for learning. And the learning around the N-word is not focused on the N-word per se. It's focused on history. It's focused on language. It's focused on identity. So to, to try to tackle and dismantle the N-word on its own terms is insufficient. It has to be dealt with in a much broader context, as does a lot of hate speech. The N-word is a form of bullying, of verbal violence and hate speech. By a show of hands, how many of you all have been targeted by hate speech? by a show of hands? Or, or how about targeted by hate? Any other hands go up? Okay, look around. So you're not alone, right? And as it was mentioned previously, oppression and these isms, they connect at a core, core level. So language conveys thoughts, beliefs, feelings, and values. But those thoughts, beliefs, feelings, and values can also be conveyed in other words, in, in other ways other than just words. They can be conveyed through our actions, through policy, through financial institutions, through governmental agencies, business practices, and more. But it's more important that we realize that people can be called the N-word without the word ever being used. various forms of microaggressions, micro-insults, micro-invalidations, micro-assaults are all part of that. And there's a segment of a population here in Evanston, the town that I love so dearly, who feel they're being called the N-word without the word ever being used. What does that look like? The reading and math scores of black children in District 65 and how many levels below white children they are. The Fifth Ward being the only ward or community in Evanston without a community school. The great funding disparities between the new state-of-the-art Robert Crown Center and, and family focus in the Fifth Ward. What does this look like? The closing of Community Hospital, the Black Hospital in Evanston. The closing of the Black YMCA. The great and deep and clearly demarcated racial and class segregation and divide in Evanston. My son in third grade was asking about the person of the week and why are we always learning about the pilgrims? Well, last month, he came to me now, he's a junior at the high school, and he said, why are we still learning about Christopher Columbus two weeks into the semester? Last week, he was at Subway and a white woman gave him a candy wrapper that said Negro on it. He was the only person of color in Subway. She gave it to him and said, oh, here, this is good luck for you. And she proceeded to lecture him about how your people volunteered to come here. And slavery was a good thing for you all. That's what the N-word looks like and feels like without ever being called the word. So in closing, I quote Dick Gregory. Comedian, civil rights activist, social critic, entrepreneur, and many more things. He says, you didn't die a slave for nothing, mama. You brought us up. You and all those Negro mothers who gave their children the strength to go on. To take that thimble to the well 
while the whites were taking buckets. Those of us who weren't destroyed got stronger, got calluses on our soul. And now we're ready to change a system, a system where a white man can destroy a black man with a single word, nigger. And when we're through, mama, there ain't going to be no niggas no more. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Logan. That was very, very impactful. My name is Henry Eberhardt. I'm a senior here at the high school, and I'm on the Lincoln-Douglas debate team. Uh, my proposal is that social media platforms should increase technologies to identify and eliminate hate speech. When we talk about hate speech traditionally, we typically envision a person or a group of people yelling, chanting, or spewing hate at others face to face. We think of the white supremacist march in Charlottesville or the Westboro Baptist Church picketing at a funeral. And while lots of hate speech occurs in this way, the term hate speech can be misleading. Sadly, and yet maybe predictably, as our world has evolved, the number of ways to be hateful has too. With the vast and growing interconnected world of the internet, social media has become a platform for hate speech. Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, along with the mess messaging board sites like Reddit and Discord are home to to toxic environments of racism, sexism, and homophobia. Statistics from the Anti-Defamation League show that almost a fourth of Americans have felt unsafe due to hate speech online. Along with being the site of hate speech, harmful ideologies on the internet also inspire hate crimes in the real world. Perpetrators of hate crimes consistently gain inspiration from supremacist ideologies on social media sites. Shannon Martinez, who helps people leave extremist groups as program director of Free Radical Projects, argues that online communities romanticize right-wing white supremacist violence. Thus, social media sites have an obligation to increase strategies to limit hate speech. Currently, social media platforms have some initiatives to eliminate hate, but the technology is underdeveloped and cannot consistently identify harmful posts. The Freedom Forum Institute's First Amendment Center identifies some platforms like YouTube and Twitter that have expansive policies around limiting hate speech, but lack the sophistication to reliably or consistently enforce those policies. Funding ought to be given to develop these identification methods to be able to consistently and reliably eliminate harmful posts when they are uploaded. For example, according to Forbes, Google has, a, has developed artificial intelligence that has the ability to identify hate speech on the internet. But early testing shows that the technology is currently racially biased. Technology companies must commit to improve technologies like these to ensure user safety. Because social media platforms control so much of our lives, it is their responsibility to ensure our safety on their sites. Thank you. Hi. So my name is Isaac. Uh, I'm also a member of the debate team and the ETHS Student Union. Hi, my name is Jessica. I'm also a member of Student Union, and I'm on the board for SOAR, which stands for Students Organized Against Racism. So next up, we have a conversation with our United States representative, Jan Schakowsky, who spent 21 years representing Illinois' 9th Congressional District. Uh, among other political pursuits, Representative Schakowsky has sponsored, uh, co-sponsored various anti-hate legislation over the last couple years, including the No Hate Act, which was introduced in July to in uh, incentivize hate crime reporting, which Representative Schakowsky has requested to co-sponsor, and the Hate Crimes Commission Act, which was also introduced in July to establish a U.S. Commission on Hate Crimes. So please welcome Representative Jan Schakowsky. So just to start off, uh, as I mentioned, the House has voted on various pieces of legislation and various pieces of legislation are still in committee. So as a member of Congress who's experienced spending over two decades there, um, can you provide us a window into what that discussion is like, who the major players are, sorts of terminology that are used, like what goes on? 
So there's a lot of legislation that has been introduced. Uh, you mentioned you mentioned some of it. Um, one of the one bill did pass the House. It has to do mainly, really, the, the Data Act collection of data, um, which is very important. Although the Southern Poverty Law Center has been collecting data for a long time, the Anti Defamation League has been um, collecting data, and we've seen a tremendous spike in anti-Semitic, anti-Muslim, anti-minority, anti-immigrant um, hate crimes, um, all of which really have been um, perpetrated by um, white extremists um, and, and um, none, by the way, by immigrants themselves who are often um, targeted as these are the people who are causing, causing your problems. So we, we have a, a, a lot of legislation um, that has passed, some that has passed the House. There is um, some that's bipartisan, not much. Um, and it's actually, again, in the area of um, more reporting and data collection. So I think what we heard today from our, our speakers is really, um, and, and one, one of them does provide funds for um, schools, for police to be trained, um, to recognize hate, hate crimes, and, and those are important. But really, we're talking about culture um, right now. We're talking about leadership yeah. right now, um, and where um, hate is um, really perpetrated from. Um, in, in, our, in our country, and this is a really tough, this is a tough time. For sure. So on that note of bipartisanship that you just mentioned, um, as we should know from various history classes, a bill has to pass both, both chambers of Congress. What this? The bill has to pass both chambers of Congress. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you, on issues of hate, how do you work across the aisle, uh, particularly in this particular Senate and this particular political climate, uh, how do you work in a bipartisan nature to uh, turn these bills and policy ideals you know, into it's law. Hard. It's really, this is, a, this is a really difficult moment to get bipartisan support. Um, one of the bills um, that uh, my colleague David Cicilline has introduced, um, the, it, the, there's an acronym, but it's really the No Hate Act. And what it would do is say that people who have been convicted um, of um, or uh, hate crimes, um, or they've had a conviction on something else with an added hate crime uh, uh, component, could not have a gun. Now, that seems like a simple thing, um, but you know how much trouble we're having getting any kind of legislation dealing with limiting the use of and availability of, uh, of weapons. I, I really want to comment, too, on the issue of the Internet, um, because our um, speaker, Ms. Brooks, was talking about how some of these new groups, these hate groups, have developed virtually overnight, um, and um, the use of the Internet. And I think, you know, so many students, I'm sure, here know about cyberbullying, you know. Maybe there used to be, in my day, a fight in the, uh, after school, but you go home, you go to the safety of your own home, and today, um, this can go on 24-7, the kind of bullying that people are experiencing. So, I'm um, part of the, of the, um, one of the most serious debates we're having now is Section 230 of the Communications Act, which virtually provides immunity for tech co for platforms from any kind of liability. And Facebook, for example, is saying, it is not our problem if there are groups that use Facebook to perpetrate all kinds of hate language, um, even in sight. Um, and so we're having a debate on this right now in the subcommittee that I chair on what is the issue. We're having a hearing on Wednesday 
do these platforms, do, does Twitter, does Facebook, do they have any responsibility and, is, and liability, can they be sued for not doing something about this hate crime, these, these, this hate language? So, as we know, like, there's been a recent wave of hate speech and white nationalism across America. Um, we wanted to know, have you seen these hateful tendencies exhibited by any of your colleagues in Congress? And if so, how have the, um, the attitudes towards hate speech developed over time? Well, l l let, me, let me just tell you, one of the things that, that I initiated um, was to work with um, my colleague, Ilhan Omar, who um, I think I agreed um, uh, early on when she came to the Congress, said some things that were old anti-Semitic tropes um, that for the, the Jews and money and those kinds of things. And I talked to her. I decided rather than just um, you know, sort of join in the critique, a lot of which happened online, I wanted to, uh, to talk to her. And the end of our conversations was that she and I did an editorial together, um, CNN um, pulled, put it out, that um, said, we, Muslims and Jews, are really two sides of the same coin of bigotry. And that because all of the murders that have occurred in the United States in 2018 um, were perpetrated, um, that were hate crimes, perpetrated by white supremacists. So what we needed to do was to work together to fight that kind of bigotry. So you're asking me about legislation, about, by, by partisanship, which is hard to achieve, but I think that members of Congress have other roles that we can play to um, talk about, frankly, talk about these issues um, and hopefully change hearts and minds that way. It's not just going to be by legislation because legislation is really hard to do right now. Yeah, so going back to kind of like what you just said about um, people working together, um, what do you think that young people could be doing right now um, to combat hate speech, and what could be done at the community level to combat hate speech? Well, you know, I thought that um, Dr. Brooks here um, slides that showed how really it's almost 50-50 in the young people in terms of people of color and, and white people. Um, and so you're really the perfect demographic group to lead the way. Um, you know, you live it every, every day. And I think in many ways, your age group is kind of over it. When it, it not everywhere, of course, not everywhere. I, you know, I'm first to admit that. And not, but not just in Evanston, Illinois. Um, when it comes to the LGBTQ community, when it comes to various religions and, and races, um, young people um, are in a somewhat different world. And so I think what we need to do is to help amplify your voice, your voices, and your experiences, um, and follow you. And that's true on so many fronts, on climate, uh, you know, and, and so many things where all I think we need to do is kind of follow along and make sure that you have platforms so that you can speak out on these issues and that you speak out from your own experiences now, what life is, is, is really like. And so um, I think that that's one of the main things that we can do. Any way that we can be helpful to you um, as I think the Democratic Party of Evanston tried to be tonight by having a, uh, a form that you helped shape. Um, those are the kinds of things we need, to, we need to focus on. Because it's not just that we, you know, think you should, you know, you're smart enough, you're, but it, it's because you really live in a world that is much more tolerant than I think many 
older people live in. And so we need to hear from you. So on that note of tolerance, for example, and how we might be the next generation, but there's still one or two decades at least until we can enter Congress and we can start our policy initiatives. Um, as student activists uh, and as people who are politically interested in the next gen uh, of the next generation, how can we work with people like you who are already in policy uh, and in places like Evanston where only 7% of people voted for Trump in 2016 um, and where you have received two thirds of the okay, vote. Let me give you an time. example of how young people have changed the political climate. I would say the politics around guns in many ways has flipped. And why is that? Um, the students from Florida, right after that mass shooting at their high school, were so smart. They came to Chicago, they came to St. Sabinus Church because they didn't want it to just be when white privileged kids get shot, but they wanted to make sure that Encompass now in this movement to change the politics around guns, we had to focus on the everyday shootings in communities of color. And I'm telling you, it's very different now. Um, the, I, I think we still have a very good chance, for example, of passing um, the universal backgrounds check bill in the, in the Senate. Many senators now, especially those um, who are up for reelection, are concerned not to do it. I serve with a, a, a woman, Lucy McBath, from Georgia, who won on the issue of guns. An African-American woman because her son was shot. We have a candidate now in um, Arizona, uh, Mike Kelly, whose wife was shot in the head, a colleague of mine, Gabby Giffords, who's running on guns. The, the young people have led the way on this issue. And I really think that one of the reasons that we have passed um, uh, the Equality Act in the House of Representatives that says that the LGBTQ community has the same rights as everybody else is because of young, young people. But it's not just about people who can, who can vote anymore. You know, when you've got Greta Thunberg going before the United Nations and saying, how dare you? How dare you? We've known about climate for the la and the, the crisis for the last 30 years. You know, just shaming 16 years old. So I think that there's so many examples now of people your age are not waiting because these things are urgent. They're urgent. And, you know, so be brave, be loud. Be unruly. Make your own rules. That is all the time we have for this particular segment. So thank you very much, okay. uh, Representative Schakowsky. Okay, thank you for inviting me. Thank you. So now I'd like to welcome back Leisha for a call to action on now that we've learned all of this, but what can we do ourselves as individuals and are in our own communities uh, about hate speech and white supremacy? So, welcome back. You can stay. I can stay. I, yes, thank you. <laughs> I'm just gonna pick up on, one, on what you said, Congresswoman. Thank you so much. The, the be loud, the be brave. Um, Kelly also mentioned it. Use your voice, stay engaged. That's why I want you, wanted you to stay. What you're doing tonight, make it not be just for tonight, and then amplify this. Start shaming your classmates. Why is it just y'all? Where, where's everybody, right? You are not even the whole debate team. You know what I mean? For sure. And so use your voice, stay engaged, be loud, be brave, be courageous, engage in courageous conversations at every opportunity, right? Find some way to even debrief what happened tonight. I loved your, your, I guess your debate, your speeches, 
yours was good too. Like, talk to to one another about it. Really delve into the content beyond just wow, that was really great. You're just your 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 debate skills are just fabulous. Talk about the content and whether or not you really believe what you said and what you think. Have those conversations with one another in a real way. Way. I agree with the congresswoman in terms of the demographics. The picture says that you're the most diverse group. You're also targeted. And it's working, right? Um, the person that was talking about kind of the internet and how people are getting picked off, those are young people that are getting picked off. So it's up to you. Why don't you be the first generation to commit to living intentionally integrated lives? Fine to have a 50-50 split on white people and people of color, but if we insist on living in segregated communities, so what? So you start that. What happens for young people and why there's so much hate, why hate happens on campus so easily and people are so, so vulnerable or susceptible to it, especially white students, because it's the first time you've been around any diversity at all. And then the white students are like, oh my gosh, white men and you, they're going to be looking for you, and I'm serious. And I care about you, and I don't want you picked off in that way. So, so start having relationships now. You're about to go to college, so commit to when you get on a college campus and you're living in a diverse community that you're taking advantage of that diversity. And that requires some real intentionality and commitment in stepping out of, are you, are you getting bored with me? No, not at all. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> it's, it requires stepping out of your comfort zone and doing something different. My life, I'll tell you, just my life is, and I love being black, and I love learning about other people. You know what I mean? Expand your life beyond yourself and the people that look like you because that's what the world's gonna be. So don't do it for the advantage that like, it's better and the world is global and you can get a job, a better job in the global economy. Do it because like, you wanna know more about other people. So that's, that's that. Then I wanted to make a shout out and an invitation to if, if there are any other students to join the debate club because y'all like, are debating real issues. Join the community service club, which I understand um, is about to become the community engagement club, which is so much better. You don't want to just set yourself up community service, giving. It's not like this paternalistic, paternalistic thing like you're giving. You're engaged with every member of the community where you're at. Um, the students organizing against racism sounds great. What you're doing, and I'm going to send you guys some stuff to help you. And then Hannah said, talked about an example of a unity rally, which I think is fabulous. And I don't know if it was just like an example of what she studied in terms of her debate thing, but y'all could organize that right here. I also heard from her that the unity rallies were supporting the people that were victimized. So you talked about, the professor talked about, not the professor, doctor talked about um, the victimization that's happening right here in your neighborhoods relative to racial violence or anti-black violence in the N-word. Get involved in that. Can you go tutor? Can you go run a class? Can you, can you lead a courageous conversation? Can you do that? I would think that if students are organizing against racism at a high school level, you should be able to help facilitate some discussions with elementary school students. You can do that, right? So those are the suggestions that I have for you. I'll be watching. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I personally am extremely excited to move forward um, from Leisha's remarks because there is so much work to do and she has a lot of great uh, wisdom to share and so did all the speakers here tonight and I think that we really will internalize that and take that forward um, throughout the next year and the rest of our lives. Thank you all for coming. Have a great night. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.